it is economically smarter for women to be thin. Women in business positions, when they are thin, they perform better, considerably better. Men, their weight doesn't have an impact. Wow. I think when we look at stuff like that, mm. you know, it's, it's, and the fact that it is like six-year-old girls who are feeling the pressure to diet. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it at least beauty standards it exist for men, but ah, yeah, this is incomparable for you. The, uh, mm. Being a woman for when it comes to beauty standards, it's, it's a really tough yeah. game. Welcome to another episode of What They Don't Tell Us. With this series, I aim to introduce you to the people who can share some of life's most valuable lessons that we should have been taught in school before many other things, but a lot of us haven't. Through these conversations, I hope to add value to your life by shedding light on the unspoken, and above all, I hope to spark your curiosity enough to be able to find the courage to unlearn where needed. We may shed light on trauma and insecurity today, so I hope you would listen with an open mind or question with the hope of understanding. I'll do the best I can to be your voice by asking the right questions to the right people. There's always room for improvement, and I promise to always aim to do better as this show evolves. Today, my guest is Danae Mercer. She is a health and travel journalist, content creator, public speaker, and self-love activist. Danae was one of the first to so boldly cover body image and body shaming in the media before it became a trend. She now speaks to an audience of 2.3 million women around the world by pulling back the curtain on social media tricks, showing how posing works and chatting about mental health. Danae comes from a background of working in the media for over 10 years. She last held the position of editor-in-chief of Women's Health and Men's Health Middle East based in Dubai. Without further ado... Please welcome Danae Mercer. Gosh, that's that's quite an intro. <laughs> oh my God. It's real. I'll take it. There we go. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. So um, just to set the tone, uh, Danae and I are friends. We've known each other for a while. And I've seen Danae uh, wearing all her different hats. I mean, Danae... Um, Oh, I, we, you and I met on Women's Health, right? Yeah, on a shoot been, for Women's Health at the been, time, like back in my Women's Health days. Exactly. So before the social media, before all the noise, <sighs> mm -hmm. and um, and I just wanted to first touch on how how everything blew up for mm -hmm. you. Were you really uh, interested in this kind of conversation early on, or were you unlearning and learning as you went about it? And how did everything blow up? I think working on women's health and working in like the health and fitness world, I was always really interested in talking about kind of self-love, body confidence, the things that you traditionally don't see, whether it's on social media or in magazines. But especially as editor of Women's Health Middle East, I felt a real, a, a kind of calling and respect for the brand not to, I, I, when, you're, when you're the editor of that kind of publication, you represent that brand. People see you as the brand. They don't see you as your own person. So while I was there, it didn't feel appropriate to me to bring in my own voice, my own opinions. You know, I was, I was representing the brand. Um, and then I resigned and I went freelance. And it, I had started, around that time, I started talking about self-love. I, I started with a post about cellulite in, it would have been April 2019. And it was a post where you know, if you, if you see me from the front and if I pose in a certain way, like my, I've always had abs. That is just my genetic makeup, you know, so I can pose and look like a fitness influencer. But then from my back, I've always had cellulite since I was 13. And again, that is my genes. So I would only show kind of the front side of myself on social media or I'd pose in certain ways to hide my cellulite. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, it got to the point where I was like, mm, this doesn't really feel true to me. It doesn't feel like what I want to be putting out there. It doesn't feel honest to the things I want to talk about. So I did a post in April 2019 that showed, you know, my abs, but then also my cellulite, like side by side. And I remember when I posted it, I was so afraid. I was so nervous, mm. which feels crazy now because it's been years. But at the time, I was like, oh, my God, you know, am I, am I doing something really stupid? Is everyone going to make fun of me? Uh, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my career as a freelance journalist, a freelance health journalist? You know, will people think I'm not valid? 
because I have cellulite, even though about 80 to 90% of women have cellulite. Anyways, did the post. And I guess from that point, from that point, I've never looked back because it, it was the first time in my life where I heard the voice of so many women saying like, oh, you have that, you know, I have that too. We're like, oh, I thought I was the only one with cellulite. I thought I was the only one with dimples there. And it made me feel a lot less alone and embarrassed and ashamed. Mm. And I think that's such a, a powerful thing. Yeah. And I haven't been willing to to give that up. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you, you touched on that, but that's what I wanted to get around as well to talk about that. As, as the editor-in-chief of Women's Health, assume your position. I mean, obviously, the magazine is putting bikini models on. Um, they have to touch up photos when they're putting them on, on, on the cover. I mean, this is what uh, uh, magazine spreads and media was all about and is all about, actually. So at that point, at that position, did you feel hypocritical to what you believe or you didn't know any better back then and you started learning as you went along what what would you say you felt at that time was it I mean I, I asked the question because I'm not a vegan but I'm obsessed with animals and I I mean you show me an animal video I'll pick that any day over anything it will break my heart in an instant if an animal is in pain yet I'm not a vegan and sometimes I kind of battle with that thought like does that make me a hypocrite for not being a vegan so I wanted to ask, was that, is that ever, I mean, even when we all started social media, we all touched up, we all did. And now a lot of us are kind of getting out of that and we're embarrassed to do it. We think it's much more cool and natural to be raw because that's where the trend and that's where people have, people like you paved the way to make so many other people comfortable to just not spend the time, you know, to edit and touch up and not be fake to a certain extent. Did you feel that way when you were at Women's Health? Did you really feel like, oh my God, I'm wearing boots that don't fit right now? No, that's a very good question. I think I like your point about learning and unlearning constantly. Yeah. And I think that's what all of us are doing. Yeah. You know, at Women's Health, I think at the time, the way we presented athletes, it, it was the standard at the time, right? Like that's what you do. And you photograph them at sunrise, all oiled up. And the athletes probably would come in having done whatever they needed to do to be in their peak physical shape and you would style them in makeup and you would do everything you could to make them look kind of like the most fierce traditional you know traditionally fierce athlete that you could and that's that's just what was done mm -hmm. I do think women's health have done a really beautiful job of kind of pivoting towards more of a you know they've changed the conversation as the conversation has changed. I think they've done a really beautiful oh, they job. Do, as I haven't uh, caught yeah, up. They did that yeah, too. They've, okay. And they've done a really, I, I would say as a brand, they've done such a beautiful job. But I'm not, that's like not really my place to speak for them. Mm -hmm. But I'm, as someone who's observing, I'm really proud of, of seeing what they've done. For me at the time as the editor, I wouldn't say I felt hypocritical. I would say I was, I was learning. Like mm -hmm. I remember one of the earliest things I did that started to change my thoughts mm -hmm is there was an artist, she's, she's still around, named Sarah Shakil, and she had done this whole beautiful campaign around glitter stretch marks. And I first came across her for the magazine. Okay. So she's someone that, you know, I must have been sent a press release or found her and was like, oh, I, I should include this. This is fascinating. That was the first time ever in my life where I saw stretch marks and thought, oh, these could be beautiful. Okay. And I think as with any learning, you know, it's kind of those grains of sand that start piling up more and more and more until it gets to a point where you're like, okay, maybe this isn't quite right for me anymore. Maybe I need to talk about things in a different way. I think that's where people are at their most brave and most courageous when they're willing to be humble enough to unlearn a programming that has been done for the longest time and not stand, stand their ground with a belief system that no longer serves them just because it's their tradition or their background or their culture or their education. So, I mean, kudos to you. I think you're very open and blatant about how you talk about that and everything you're learning along the way. I love that. Um, but I want to ask you, who are you talking to when you're putting your message out? Because you obviously can't speak to everybody. Everybody has their own perspective and their own thoughts and their own opinion, and their own disciplines, and their own mindset. 
So if you're talking to an alcoholic, let's say, um, in rehab, obviously your tone of voice and the message you're putting across is dedicated to an alcoholic. Maybe I won't understand. I'll be like, okay, why don't you just not have a drink? It's easy for me to say that Mm -hmm. because I'm not in their shoes. So I wanted to just really get your, your answer to who are you talking to? You're not talking to the athlete. You're not talking to the person that has full on discipline to wake up at 5 a.m. But who are you talking to? It's funny you ask that because my my husband, who is an incredible supporter of my career and I would say is my biggest cheerleader and is kind of there encouraging me every step of the way. But sometimes he doesn't necessarily understand everything I say or everything I do. For instance, I'm a very big advocate of throwing out your scale. Like I think so many of us women, we have that scale and we step on it once a week or once a day. And I bet 80 to 90% of the time that scale makes us feel worse. It's not really serving us. It's often a, 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 a bad measure of so many things. And for someone like me, the scale was incredibly detrimental. And it really fed into... I developed an eating disorder when I was 19. I got to the point where I was weighing myself multiple times a day and I became obsessed with those numbers. And I think a lot of women, in one way or another, they do that, Mm -hmm. right? We have this ideal number in our head. When I hit this weight, I'm going to be so happy. When I hit this weight, I can ask that guy out on a date or, you know, when I hit this weight, that's when everything will come together. Or like, oh, I, you know, I've gained five pounds. I need to lose those before the holiday or Or maybe you weigh yourself every single day and it ruins your day because maybe you've put on a pound of water weight, whatever it is. The scale is really, really dumb. For me, I think it's really dumb. And my husband is kind of like, because all through my pregnancy, he was at all my doctor's appointments and I would ask my doctor and my nurse not to ever tell me my weight because there are still some things that I think aren't healthy for me to know, my weight being one of them. I understand that they needed to know my weight for different health reasons. I didn't want to know it. Mm-hmm. And my husband, after those meetings, he'd be a bit like, but don't you want to know your weight? It's a good indicator of, you know, should, is, are, are you growing in the right direction? Like, is this, is everything okay? Like, what's wrong with knowing your weight? Mm-hmm. And I tr- I've tried to explain to him. I'm like, sweetie, it's, I cannot, I cannot. And he, and he struggles to understand that. He just, it's just such a far, far different reality to the one he lives. Mm-hmm. And so but come, see, there's no right or wrong there, I no, would say. No, exactly. I mean... I would speak for myself. I mean, I'm an athlete. I train. Mm -hmm. And if I were to want to shed for whatever reason, I will need to know if I'm working in the right direction. But it's not wrong to say that I when I I do check my weight because I need to know this is the kind of food I can eat. This is what I'm digesting properly. This is the quantities I'm I'm supposed to eat to get to that goal. If I want to bulk, I'll do the opposite. And my my scale is the indicator. But just as long as I am not emotionally attached to that number. And it, I do get there. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes when I'm on a shed and I'm not seeing the scale budge to the number I need to get to, I get frustrated. I get angry. I get obsessive. And and I realize, oh, hold on, Tracy, take a step back now. I have the, maybe the mental strength to say, shake it off, Tracy, take a step back. And I literally would move the scale away. Two weeks later, I'll come back to it. I have to fight it. And it's, it's, it's the reality. But a lot of people and will really hold on to that. And it will start messing up so many things in their life. They will feel like, I mean, at least I will speak for myself because I can't speak for a lot of people that suffer with this thing. But I could really hear myself say, I hate that I'm not disciplined. I hate mm-hmm. that I don't have the the mental strength, the power to like stick to the damn cut. I mean, I need a month to reach this goal that I want to reach as an athlete. And it's fine to have those goals too, which is something we can touch on uh, as well, because a lot of people kind of say, yeah, but you're not supposed to be pushing, uh, you know, having an athletic body, for instance, because we're trying to steer away from that. I don't believe that. I think we're just trying to steer away from having one version of beauty. That's it. It doesn't mean that we should stop motivating people or talking about discipline or pushing people to be the best version of themselves. We'll touch on that. But I get that with the scale because I do start like second guessing and doubting myself. And someone who's maybe mentally stronger than me when it comes to food, like my trainer, in her eyes, she's just like, but Trace, just just don't don't eat the cookie. Like she'll literally have this opinion. I'll be like, yeah, but that's so easy for you because 
For me, put me in the gym two hours a day if you want to, and it's so easy for me. Maybe somebody else just to think about putting on gym clothes and walking into the gym is so stressful. But because I like it, it's easy. My trainer doesn't care that much about food. So because for her, she's just like, okay, but I don't, you know, just have chicken and broccoli. I'm like, but dude, I could do that for a week, but then I'm suffering, <laughs> right? So I get that. Give me the cookie. <laughs> I get that. I get that. Um, so yeah, this, it's not for everybody, but I get your husband to, in the sense where like, yeah, you want to track it. Yes, it's true, but there's also a pers perspective by perspective. That's what's important. How are you feeling and how are you dealing with it? But maybe we touch on that. Where do you think the message becomes unclear and where do you feel misunderstood? Because like all noble causes, all messages start with a good cause and a good message until someone messes it up and someone misconstrues it. And then they take it with their own eyes and their own perspective and they take it in a direction that you never meant to take it. Where do you feel people are taking your message and misconstruing it or adding a layer on top of it for it no longer to resemble you? I think when people use my content to shame influencers, I hate that. Okay. Because I think so much of what I talk about, it's not, it's the whole point is not to shame other women. It's not to be ashamed of yourself. And so I don't like when people ask me, oh my gosh, did you see, you know, this influencer's posing. Don't you hate that? Don't you hate her? Isn't she horrible? Isn't she a bad example? I'm like, no, <laughs> like, yeah. the like, don't drag me into this. Don't, and also the internet can be a really mean place. I will never shame another woman for showing up however she chooses to show up, especially knowing how cruel the internet can be. Mm -hmm. So I don't like that. I don't like when they use it against influencers. I think also we touched on, you know, maybe people are shaming, you said, you know, athletes for having their own goals. Mm -hmm. I, I am someone who really admires athletes. I love people who have their own goals and train for their own reasons. My message isn't don't train, don't go to the gym. It's not that. It's make sure whatever you're doing serves you and feels right for you, whether that's having a goal of, you know, cutting and bulking or whatever you're doing, or it's today I fit in like a 10 minute workout while my baby was flopping around doing her baby stuff. And that's my goal right now. That's okay too. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is, that's okay. So it, I just hate when people use my words or my content to shame someone else in whatever form. Mm. Do you feel like maybe, again, we said that we're not ta you're not talking to everybody. You have a specific group of people mm -hmm. with a speci specific mindset that you're trying to help, right? Um, but do you sometimes feel that maybe your message could encourage people to be complacent instead of to be the best version of themselves. And the best yeah. version of themselves includes putting in some discipline with your workouts, putting in some discipline with your food to your capacity. Not everybody has the same goals. Like like we said, not everybody gives a shit about a six pack, but everybody should care to, to be healthy. And do you feel like sometimes people misconstrue your message to be comfortable in being complacent like just because we're talking about all body shapes are okay, then I don't need to get out of my unhealthy. And that's the more important thing. If you are actually unhealthy, I don't need to get out of being unhealthy because now we're celebrating all body types. I think if people were consuming only my message and didn't exist in the rest of the world today, if they were just in a bubble, only reading my message and maybe reading it through a very certain lens, because I often do talk about balance. I'm really into fitness myself. I love health. I love training. It makes yeah. me feel better. Perhaps, perhaps there would be a way to misconstrue things. But I think in the world that we exist as women, from the time we are small children, our bodies are being judged, commented on, shamed, our choices, our decisions, everything about anything we do, we are told is right or wrong, good or bad. And especially when it comes to our physical appearance, like new studies are showing children as young as six, girls as young as six, are dissatisfied with their bodies. They think they're fat. They think they need to go on diets. Six years old. That's insane. And so I think in that context of the world we live in today, a voice like mine 
I'm not worried about it making people complacent. I'm just trying to help women realize that so much of the pressure we feel is created by an outdated patriarchal society that profits off our insecurities. And we can navigate our lives in ways that feel right to us. For me, that is, that is, you know, training. It is, um, I love going to the gym. I love moving my body. That is my moving, I see it as my moving meditation. You know, I'm not the best at meditation. I get wiggly and kind of antsy. But when I train, my brain switches off and I feel at peace. So for me, that is my way of navigating this correctly. But it's also saying for me, for my body, even at my thinnest, even at my most uh, trained, you know, I used to compete for Cambridge University as a modern pentathlete. So we were training seven, eight times a week for hours. I still had cellulite. Mm -hmm. So for me, again, that balance is saying, yes, I can train. Yes, I love to move my body, but I still have cellulite and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, I love that. And I, I think maybe the goal or the, the, the idea is to do everything you can to, within your capacity, be the better or, or growing version of you. And whatever the outcome of that is, be happy with it and be content with it. There is no specific outcome that is the only one that's applicable or the only one that's accepted. Because the, the, I think the goal is the journey. I mean, as, as cliche as that sounds, the goal is to be on a journey to self-growth. It's not the destination of a six pack, the destination of the CEO's chair, the destination of whatever. It's just being on a growth journey. And that's, I think that's the, the perspective I would have that I would hate to encourage complacency because I know how, how much I've grown and how much I've changed just by working on myself. If I didn't work on myself and I stayed who I was and how I thought when I was 21, that little insecure girl who really did not put any effort into thinking that she's anything more than what she looks like would stay an older insecure vulnerable girl who just spoke loud words because I always maybe had a personality but I was hiding behind vulnerability and insecurity so I know how important it is to to believe that you can to believe that a bit of discipline will free you free you from thinking that you're smaller than you are, uh, dumber than you are, uh, uh, you know, not as attractive as you are. I, I remember there was a period in my life where now I wear, let's say, really, a really loose t-shirt and really loose pants. And I still think I'm, I look good. You're but amazing. when I was a bit younger, I always thought that, no, I need to have like a tight top on or a mm -hmm. short top on. Like some skin had to show for me to be, to go out at night, let's say, for me to kind of look good, you know? Not that I was very cleavage or very, but maybe I did sometimes, but there was always something that had to show, whether it's my legs or whether it's my back or whether it's my cleavage or something had to show for me to feel like, okay, now I'm, I feel confident. I would literally go to a club tonight wearing a loose t-shirt and loose pants and I still feel very attractive. Why? Though I'm older, though maybe when I was 25, uh, I looked younger or whatever, but I just feel good in my skin because I'm, I have so much that I'm working on on myself that it's not all about what I look like. I don't need a guy's eyeballs on my skin for me to feel like I'm attractive. Mm -hmm. I don't need your eyeballs. I know what I, that I'm attractive. And I think I, I worry sometimes about this message between women empowerment, meaning dress like you want, act like you want, uh, go online and show your uh, booty, show your cleavage, and we're empowering you because you can do whatever you want. As a woman, I would not want to encourage other women to feel like that is what empowerment means. Empowerment doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't mean actually that you should be showing your body online and not giving a shit because no one can tell you what to do. I would rather send a message to say like women empowerment is about really being content and confident in who you are and that takes a lot of work for you to grow and elevate do you feel like there's sometimes this misconception and what does women empowerment in your opinion mean I love that you are talking about women empowerment I think it's it's incredibly important and 
I like that you mentioned kind of your growth story, mm -hmm. right? And how now you can go wearing, I mean, probably even what you're wearing right now, which is beautiful. Uh, maybe you go to a club mm -hmm. and you feel super confident, super comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because if you look at like how many times all of us, I imagine, we've gone to bed and we have felt amazing in our body, amazing in our skin. We have felt a thousand bucks. We wake up the next morning and maybe we go to work and then suddenly we're like, oh, my body is so bad. Oh, yeah. I look so horrible. Oh, I'm just, I'm just awful. And then maybe the next day, oh, I am stunning. I'm gorgeous. I'm radiant. I'm so powerful. I think this, this little thing, this little thing of how our body image can change every day or even within minutes shows that it's not really about this external shell, mm -hmm. like our empowerment, our confidence. It's I don't think it has much to do with this, although this is important. This is our kind of wrapping, our house, our, our home. But I think all of it starts from the inside. Mm -hmm. And that's why so much of our body image is dictated by how we're feeling, how our emotions are. So to come back to your point of what I think women empowerment, female empowerment looks like, for me, I think it's kind of that freedom to choose, that freedom to tune in to what feels right for us while trying to block out, you know, we're surrounded by a thousand different voices and maybe we grow, maybe we, when we're younger, we think what we want, what we want to do is this or that. And as we get older, maybe we think it's something else, but it's that freedom to choose. Yeah, that's that freedom to choose, uh, definitely. And also the freedom to do something for yourself and not because you're getting affirmation from the outside world or yeah. from another man or from another, you know, position or a job or whatever. Like it's really choosing based on what you really want. You know, I think that's, I think that's, that's quite important. It's so hard to find because to get there first, you have to tune into that inner voice. Right. Mm -hmm. And for someone like me, I mean, you asked earlier who I'm speaking to, and I think often I'm speaking to versions of myself or who I needed when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And for someone like me, like I'm not very good at tuning into that inner voice. Mm -hmm. It always feels like other people's voices are more important. Yeah. You know, and making sure they're happy is more important. And so I lose that inner voice. And I think a lot of women, we struggle with that as well, mm -hmm. just because the way we are raised. Of course. So I love that you pulled in this idea of, you know, we we need the freedom to choose and being able to tune into that inner voice. And But it's hard to find that voice. I agreed. I mean, I feel that you said something earlier about Waking up one day feeling like you're on top of the world, waking up the next feeling like crap. And mm. um, yes, true. A lot of it, it has to do with what you look like. Um, and I, but I also can't help but notice because I also have a lot of male friends and I hear a lot of stories and I see and I'm very observant. You see men, I believe, struggling with the exact same thing when it comes to body image. It's not just a woman thing. I watch men who are insecure about putting on a bit of weight, constantly do this. Uh, I hear how my husband's friends or my husband would say something like, my God, I need, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel good. And, and it's, it's, I feel like it's just how we're brought up and women, maybe with their, with the emotions that we have, with how we, we, with how we think, uh, with the, with obviously how much we have been exposed in the media to what we should look like. We, it, it rings louder, but I think it's a, a public, a general problem in, with men as well. I know some men that throw up, that are that throw up after they eat a lot just so that they don't put a lot of weight on, you know, for that evening. And they, they talk about it as a joke. Sometimes like uh, a, a girl I know had said, my husband, you know, he throws up when he eats a lot. Ha ha ha. That he's like, yeah, I know because I don't, I just feel bad before I sleep. But no, that's, that's not just that you feel bad before you sleep, that is a problem. You're afraid to put on the weight and that is leading you to be bulimic. Let's call it spade of spades, right? So I think everybody's kind of struggling with this. And there's a lot of attention drawn on women now, but I also kind of want to draw the attention on men that struggle with this too. And they are more embarrassed than ever to speak about that because they feel like it's a woman's problem. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be talking about me caring about what I look like, me caring about my weight, me wanting to look have a certain number on the scale. So I kind of feel bad that there's no attention on that direction too. But it's tricky because I think, first off, I completely agree that there are absolutely men struggling with this. And I think that's a really valid problem that 100% should be addressed. And I 
you know, I've had wives come to me, women come to me and say, oh, my husband, my boyfriend, my partner is struggling. Can you help? Can you talk about that? I can't. That's not my experience. I'm not, you know, I will never claim to know that journey. So I think that's one thing. I think also simultaneously, like, the pressure put on women to look a certain way, I would say is is quite a lot higher than the pressure put on men. I mean, if you if you just look at aging in Hollywood, right? Men are allowed to age, women aren't. Mm-hmm. Look at film posters and how once you see this, you'll never be able to unsee it. They will edit an older actress to look 20 years old. They won't touch the man. Really? Look, Notice, just now that you know, just look at film posters when they come out and you will always see the kind of smooth skin, glowing, radiant, older actress and like the craggly, white haired man. Or even The Economist just did a report looking at the power of thinness. And to summarize this great, quite great article, uh, it is economically smarter for women to be thin. Women in business positions, when they are thin, they perform better, considerably better. Men, their weight doesn't have an impact. Wow. I think when we look at stuff like that, mm. you know, it's, it's, and the fact that it is like six-year-old girls who are feeling the pressure to diet. Mm-hmm. Yes, it, it at least beauty standards excuse. exist for men, but. Uh, yeah, this is. And comparable for you. The, uh, being a woman, for when it comes to beauty standards, it's it's a really tough yeah. game. I saw what you posted recently. It really like it broke my heart when, when you posted uh, how we grew up. I mean, we're we're the same age, so I know the music we used to listen to, the, the talk shows we used to see, and just to re-listen to the conversations that were had that we would probably laugh at back then. Aha, that's so funny. They made a comment about Britney Spears's boobs. Oh my God, that's so funny. They made. You know, we used to maybe, maybe, I, I, I don't remember paying attention to it back then or, or it really triggering anything back then. But in hindsight, I'm just like, are you serious? Are you seriously making a comment like that on live TV? You know, it's just insane. And the fact that you put that compilation together, I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, I cannot believe this is the world that we lived in, you know? Take my hands. Close your eyes. Now feel. Hey, cute. Do you ever think you'd see the day? Me with a purse? Mother of God, what's with the gut? Honor going to get white permission. There was an argument for Bolivia. It's my honest ass. Pacific Vista has never had a fat cheerleader. Want to avoid? Fat losers. this up, but don't you think you'd lose, lose a few pounds? Natalie, who works here? The chubby guy. He's huge. He's not going to be a top model. That it was so normalized, right? I remember when Jessica Simpson was mocked in the media for being fat. Mm. She wasn't overweight. But the media twisted it that way. And I remember at the time as a young girl seeing that and thinking, oh, that is so true. Yeah. You know, I mean, oh. we all did that. It's insane. It's so true. You'd see like cellulite. I'm like, oh, my God, my sister, I'd forward it to my sister, Ray. Oh, my God, look, she has cellulite. We make remarks like that. It's insane. It's true. I mean, the fact that they normalize it so much that even us women normalized it making fun or making a comment or thinking, oh my God, Britney Spears gained weight. That's crazy. You know, I mean, and you never really think about it until like what you just did with that post. It made me sit for a second and think, how must have, how must have Britney felt when she saw everybody saying, how is she still dancing on stage looking like that? Like no one really puts themselves in somebody else's shoes. Imagine that was me. And I wake up one day and I See every, and I had put on 10 kilos and I see everybody making remarks to say, ooh, get off, you look disgusting. How are you still dancing? How are you still performing? How are you still on social? How the hell would I feel? And nobody really cares about what these people felt. That's what's so sad. But I think to come back to your point of learning and unlearning, I do think now 
we are better with that. Like we are more sensitive of to a lot of those conversations. It's still happening, but it's so much better. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's so much better. I totally agree. Um, what is the ugliest comment you've ever received from somebody? Uh-huh. And also, what is the saddest or most heartfelt com- uh, message you received from someone who's like backing up your message or who needs you in their life? Well, gosh, okay. The ugliest, I think it's one that really stuck with me because it was quite a vulnerable time in my life. It was after I had um, had a miscarriage and we were trying again for a baby. And I was kind of talking about, because we had started looking at like uh, IUI, like a kind of assisted fertility journey. And I had been really open about that on social media. And there was this woman who, or man, I, I think it was a woman, the account was a woman, who on Facebook Messenger, which I hardly ever look at, I just, it's, you know, it's just, uh, I look at my Instagram messages, but Facebook Messenger, and I had just, I just happened to open it, and she'd been messaging me consistently for, it must have been about six months, but each message was vile. It was horrible. A direct message, mm-hmm. not even on your comments. No, it'd be, it, they were DMs, and she was like DMing me on Facebook Messenger for over six months, responding to different things, different stories, this and that. And so I think I'd posted a picture of my cellulite and stuff. And to summarize her message to me, which I just happened to see, it was basically along the lines of, well, maybe, you know, you were unable to get pregnant because you have such like a disgusting, flabby body and, and butt, which she used more vulgar words, you know, and, and it kind of went on to criticize me about that's my body, my horrible, disgusting, shameful body is the reason I had a miscarriage and I will never be a mother. That was a pretty awful one. That's <laughs> awful. <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. I can't even Would imagine. not recommend it. <laughs> I can't no. even imagine. I mean, no, you're, already, you're already vulnerable and upset in that point in time. And this is what you, I mean, how, how, how are people the way they are? Sometimes I just don't get it. Well, and I think this is one of the reasons why I will never judge what another woman chooses to put on social media. Because I think as someone who loves what she does I'm so proud of it I'm so proud of our, my community the conversations we have but there still is that one or two percent that are just horrific mm-hmm. you know and you have to be in a strong enough place surrounded by supportive people to be able to handle that yeah so I will never judge I agree how someone chooses I to mean, show up e- online even even if someone is showing up I mean if the completely opposite to what you're doing constantly touching up their photos I think about that sometimes uh, like really augmenting what they look like using these beauty filters. Why are they doing that? That's more of the question. Like, why are you doing that? You know that you're going to walk in public later on. You're going to look nothing like that, but you still choose that. You know that someone might tell you, you look nothing like your Instagram account, but you still choose that. And if you're still choosing that, what must be going on what kind of pain or insecurity must you be feeling for you to feel like even if it means a bit of a dose of of pleasure or confidence even if it's hidden behind something that's not real I'll take it I'll just take it but the the harassment and the and the and the just the cruelty of what people could say and do I mean going back to what you you told me you heard is just it's just unheard of but I know you continue to push the message you push and put yourself in a vulnerable position, which is vulnerable. You're putting yourself literally under a microscope and whatever flaws that was presented back then, you're like, I'm just going to put it out there. It's, it's hard. I mean, not a lot of people have that courage and that confidence and that bravery. Even now when other influencers are trying to put themselves in that limelight because they also want to spread that, you would notice the difference between how you portray it, how you push it, and how another influencer would in the sense where she would barely show a little bit of a curve because it's still difficult. You can't. People are are too scared, right? Mm. Even till this day, although they'll show a bit of cellulite, even myself, I don't go around squeezing my thighs to show my cellulite, well, although I have cellulite, and I will not do it because it just it's not a comfortable place for me. So what you're doing, honestly... However people are going to take it, how, whatever questions you have, and I wanted to ask questions from both sides, the, the bravery and the courage it takes to put yourself out there like that is second to none. And I just really wanted to put that out there. Um, 
And like we talked about the the harsh comments that you get from the positive comments, what is the most heartfelt one that you have ever gotten? Gosh, well, this I I, I love. This is what I love about what I do is just the the chance to hear different people's stories and just to know that I made someone feel in whatever big or small way a little bit better. It, for me, it's it's one of the biggest blessings. I think one of my favorite comments I've ever received, and it's it's stuck with me, was a dad who messaged that he had a daughter, I think five, six, seven years old, who was starting to break down her body. And she was doing it particularly through looking at social media. And then she would, you know, kind of compare herself to what she was seeing and, and end up feeling bad about herself, six, seven years old. And so he sat down with her and he opened my account and he kind of talked her through a lot of the photos to start that conversation about, you know, I, th this is one angle and this is how she looks. This is a different angle. This is how she looks. Or, I don't know, bodies can move and jiggle or fold in different ways. And he messaged me saying that he sat down with her for about two hours as they worked through my account so that they could have that dialogue so that she was armed with a few more tools for when she goes back on social media, which, you know, kids these days, kids these days, mm -hmm. they live on social media. So this is their world. And at least now she can navigate it a little better. And I, I thought that was, I thought that was really beautiful. That is honestly so beautiful on so many levels, just because it's also coming from a father. Mm. And it's uh, the fact that you're a lesson, you know, and you're like a light in a world of darkness. I mean, social media can be very dark if you're looking at the wrong things. Um, and it's hard to look at, the, the light or not to be co not to compare and especially if, as a child right so I mean that's that's amazing I love that you're honestly like a lesson which is which is such a nice thing um what do you think is the worst thing that that kids are exposed to whether it's boys or girls right now on social media mm -hmm. or on social why? media is it is it in the body image department or is it other stuff mm. I think what's going to be really tricky for them is AI and how that's being used in the body image and beauty world. Mm -hmm. On one hand, we have filters that are increasingly intelligent, so it's harder and harder to tell mm -hmm. when it's a filter, when it isn't. You have new filters that, you know, we're used to traditional filters that if we touch our face or touch our eyes, maybe an eyelash goes on our forehead or the lips kind of flicker off and on. New technology is making doesn't do that, that it doesn't happen. So filters are looking increasingly realistic, whether it's face or body. You know, there's really powerful, very easy to use body video editing software out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's only going to grow quite drastically now that video editing is, is kind of the primary platform. You also have a whole rising, like I would say slew, a whole rising group of AI influencers. And these are women who, you know, maybe they look late 18, early 19, 20, who are living lives, going to holidays, trying on bikinis, talking about doing their hair and their makeup routine, only they're not real. And they look incredibly real, but they look like the most face-tuned, yeah. kind of perfected <laughs> version. Yeah, and it's it's now at the point, I actually need to do a post on this, but it's no longer just static images, it's now videos, and they're very convincing videos. And what is scary to me about this is, you know, people look at these videos and once they know they're fake, they're like, oh, I could have told that that was fake. I would have known that was fake. One, I can make a real video of myself look like that just by using Facetune and, and you know. Two, this is the worst that these videos ever will be. This mm -hmm. is the ground level. That technology is only going to get better at an exponential rate because that is what kind of computer technology does. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe you could look at that and you're like, no, it's too perfect. Maybe... I don't know, AI struggles with hands, right? It always screws up the hands. They have six fingers, 20 fingers. Oh, it does it? I have yeah. never noticed. It okay. really struggles with hands, which is funny. <laughs> but this is the worst it's ever going to be. It's only going to get better. Mm. And that, we had to compete with magazines. Our children are going to have to compete with a world where there are girls so beautiful, only technology could have created it, except they won't know, is that technology or is that real? Mm. Would you let your daughter use social media at a young age? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a question of will I or won't I because I feel like children do, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's at home or at school. Yeah, they'll find but it. They will find a way. So will I? Yes, but I hope that I can help educate her 
to do it safely. Gotcha. For me, it's kind of like in the U.S., we don't allow drinking until 21, which I personally think is really stupid mm -hmm. because my first experience with alcohol was at a frat house, underage, illegal, in an unsafe environment where I didn't know how to not get blackout drunk. Mm -hmm. That's a horrible way to learn. Mm -hmm. In Europe, children start young. They don't understand this blackout drinking culture. I started young. We all did in Lebanon. I mean, I, I, I think I had, I had my first drink at 15. I was really young. And uh, I think it goes the same with everything else. Um, you know, not being able to have the conversation, not being able to have safety in your home, to mess up, and the first people you think of should be your parents to protect you. I mean, not your other 14-year-old friend to save you. And that's where it is. It's not so much about them not making mistakes. It's about them making mistakes, but wanting to come to you to help fix it. And know? that's how I think social media, for me personally, that's how I will navigate it with my daughter. Yeah. So she's not like watching it behind your back and then consuming the wrong stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because they, again, they will, right? Yeah. Children are curious and they're sponges. Yeah. I mean, the, what... Kids are watching porn and obviously no parents are like, uh, listen, do not, uh, let's watch. You know, if they're uh, yeah. not going to watch, if they're not going to explain what porn is publicly or explain what sex is, then all these guys, and we've seen this, mm -hmm. are growing up thinking sex looks a certain way because it was forbidden and hidden and that's how they learned exactly. about it. They're and all really... these girls are thinking that's what I need to do. I need to perform. I need to allow that. Exactly. That's another mm -hmm. actually huge topic. Big conversation. Yeah. A big conversation. Maybe quickly let's touch on that because i really like to dive into that with you. Um, growing up thinking that sex looks a certain way and a woman should look like a certain way when she's performing or when she's having sex, where she tends to forget how to, how to feel pleasure. Cause that was, that's what sex was about, how to feel pleasure when you're having sex. And it's not how to look good. Does my curves, do my curves look nice? Am I posing just right? I mean, I can't tell you the countless number of women who started having sex with a feeling of, I need to make sure that he thinks I look amazing. He thinks I look, I'm the best sex he's ever had. I look so phenomenal and so sexy that he wants to come back. Versus, I want to have sex and see how this feels and connect and, you know, kind of enjoy it. I feel like men are not really thinking I want her, her to think that I'm a beast. You know, no. he's thinking I just want to have sex, you know, <laughs> I want to offload. <laughs> And it's just, it's just insane. Oh, and I, just, I hope enough people would have this conversation. I think it's such an important conversation. And it's one of the things, you know, women struggle with body image, especially in the bedroom and especially with their partners. Mm -hmm. I'm newly postpartum and I've, I am so thankful that my husband has been so delicate and supportive with me because my body, although, you know, it, maybe I can hide it or show it in certain ways, but my body is different. Things are different. And he has been so supportive and loving. And if he wasn't, if he said a bad word or horrible thing, I, I think it would have torn me apart. Off. Of course. But it's often because we have that pressure, even in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. A lot thanks to porn, but oh, that's just a whole another huge another conversation. Discussion. Yeah. I'm going to ask you the final question. Mm. Um, if you could tell us that thing, what they don't tell us. If there's anything you learned that you wish you would have known before as a little girl or in whatever light that you want to shed it, what do they not tell us? I think they don't tell us often enough to really, really, really listen to your voice. And maybe we see this in like Disney films, right? The hero, the princess who discovers her voice and uses it and sings it. It's empowering. I don't think that's what my voice journey has looked like. It's kind of a constant daily choice of tuning into that like little kernel of truth inside me that all this other noise is trying to drown out, all these other pressures. But at the end of the day, if I really tap into myself, that kernel is there. Mm -hmm. And when we don't listen to it, I think that's when so many of us become ill or unhealthily obsessed with our body, our weight, or how we show up in the bedroom, you know, because we're not tapping into that one thing that makes us us. Mm -hmm. So just listening, listening to your voice and really honoring that. And I think things, everything else... It won't be a magical, you know, fairy princess land, but everything else will fall a little bit more into place. I love that. So nice. Danae, thank you so, so, so much for coming. I mean, we've been trying to get this talk in for <laughs> about a year. 
and we finally made it happen. So. Well, I'm glad we squeezed it in between showering and bottle feeding and right? all that other chaos. But um, no, it's been my pleasure to be here. This is a really wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Janae.